Thank you for joining us today for our 2018 Autism uh, Institute community sessions. Um, today's topic is on reinforcement. My name is Rachel White, and I am a BCBAD at the Center for Human Development. Um, everyone is muted. Um, we will be using the chat function and um, perhaps a couple of polls that we'll send out. Um, if you are listening in by phone, um, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to participate in those pieces, but you'll still be able to hear us. We are recording this session. Um, if you do not want to be on video and you do not have to be on video, you can turn off your video camera. It should be towards the bottom left of your screen. Looks like a rectangle with a triangle next to it. And you can turn off your video if you would like. Um, this is the second of our four um, webinars. Sorry, losing my words already. This is the second of our four webinars, and today we are going to be joined by um, Becky Parento, and she is also a BCBA at the Center for Human Development, and she and I are going to be presenting um, half and half. She's going to present first. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share the screen so that you guys can see our slides and I am going to um, turn it over to Becky. Hey everyone. Um, like Rachel said, my name is Rebecca Parento. I work at the Center for Human Development. Most of my work is around um, working for a program called the Complex Behavior Collaborative, which is a state program um, prior to moving to Alaska about five and a half years ago, I was in Boston for five years at a center called the May Center. Um, it primarily was for children with autism. It was a day and residential school. Um, so like Rachel said, this is the second round of webinars that we're doing, um, and it's going to be on reinforcement, which is probably the most important thing, if not definitely up there with the top three. Um, so, what is reinforcement? Reinforcement is anything that happens right after the behavior that increases the likelihood of that behavior happening again. Um, so that can be a whole multitude of things that is going to increase a behavior that you're looking at. So the first thing you want to identify is that behavior, and that could be a behavior that you're trying to increase. Um, you know, maybe it's attending, maybe it's the amount of homework that they're completing, or it could be a behavior that we're trying to decrease. So it could be a maladaptive behavior like hitting um, or off task or um, self injurious. So reinforcement is very ind individualized and different to every kid um, and it changes and I'll go into more detail about that, but it can be anything. So it can be a high five, it can be delivering a token to a child, um, it can be praise. I love the way you're sitting in your seat. Um, I love the way that you just finished your homework. Great job standing in line. Um, it can be small edibles, sometimes candy, preferably something more healthy. Um, or reinforcement can be anything that we don't initially think is positive if it increases the behavior. So it could be reprimanding or yelling at a child. Um, it doesn't matter the intentions of to discipline or teach the child to minimize a particular behavior, but if that child's specific behavior increases after yelling or reprimanding that child, then that child, and then we, okay, I'll give you an example. Say you have a child that's doing a lot of talking back and <laughs> you've tried a bunch of stuff and you get really upset one day and you yell at them for talking back to you. And the next day, they talk back even more. And it happens with a longer duration and an increased frequency. Although you wouldn't think that you're 
providing reinforcement for, for the behavior, if that child is attention maintained, then that yelling can actually be reinforcing. So what I want you guys to take away from that is reinforcement is anything that follows the behavior that increases that behavior, okay? Um, so there are four functions to behavior that I want to quickly go over. Um, there is attention, which means that a kid is going to exhibit a behavior because they're trying to get attention from a peer or a staff or anything else in their environment. Um, the example I just gave you would be a kid maintained by attention as his function. Um, you're going to increase the behavior if the function is, is attention. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm starting to get a cold, I apologize. My throat is very sore. Um, if that child is maintained by attention, delivering that attention right after the behavior that you're trying to reduce can increase that behavior. Um, another function is escape. So this is a really easy one. We engage in this all day long. Um, we hit an alarm to escape getting out of bed. We you know, avoid that person in the office because we don't want to talk to them. Um, the third function is tangible. This is also a very easy function to understand. So that's simply, typically a denial of a tangible for that child. So if you said he couldn't have a lollipop at that time and then he throws a tantrum, that would be a, the function would be tangibly maintained. Um, and then the fourth is automatic reinforcement. This is commonly what you hear as self-stimulatory behavior for our kids on the spectrum. Um, so those are behaviors that occur independent of social mediation by others. So it doesn't matter what's going on in the environment around them. Um, typical examples of us um, using self-stimulatory behavior would be like biting our nails. Um, I twirl my hair a lot. Um, I shake my feet a lot. Uh, scratching an insect bite is also a really common example of self-stimulatory, but in our guys and clients with autism, commonly self-stimulatory and automatic reinforcement is going to look like flapping and rocking, um, but there can be a whole multitude of other things that that'll look like. It's different for every kid and every person. So now that we've kind of went over those four functions, we're going to talk about positive reinforcement. Rachel, you can go forward now. Sorry. Um, so positive reinforcement is pretty simple. Negative gets a little more tricky, but positive reinforcement is simply when you add something, some type of stimulus to the environment that increases the likelihood of that behavior. So say, I'm gonna give you an example for a maladaptive behavior that we're talking about. So a student sitting at his desk in class um, and he's given a math worksheet he sees its division, he hates division, it's very hard for him, and he rips up the worksheet. Um, his teacher scolds him immediately and then gives him another worksheet. He rips that worksheet up too and his classmates. So I said that's an example of positive reinforcement for a negative behavior that we're actually trying to increase the amount of work he's doing, um, but be, we're actually increasing the likelihood that he's going to to not do the work. <laughs> so um, what I'm saying is that that immediate scalding stimulus that he was given after ripping up the sheet actually increased the likelihood that he's going to rip up more sheets in the future because he was attention maintained. Um, another example of that would be an example that I think of 100,000 times a day because I have a two-year-old that's potty training. <laughs> um, a two-year-old goes pee pee on the potty, <laughs> and he immediately receives a Pez from a novel Pez collection. Um, he then pees on the potty three more times that day because he really wants that Pez. Um, that's another example of positive reinforcement where we're just trying to increase good behavior um, and not accidentally reinforce a bad behavior, which was the prior example. Um, so that's a pretty common example of positive reinforcement. Like I said, it doesn't have to be an object. It can be scolding. It can be praise. It can be, it's anything that's added to that environment that increases the behavior. Okay. So then there's another one called negative reinforcement. This one is a little bit harder to grasp, um, but I have some pretty clear examples and I think you'll be able to 
follow them, excuse me. Um, so for negative reinforcement, for the maladaptive example I have, a student is handed a division worksheet and rips up his sheet. The teacher does not give him another worksheet and he does not have to finish the math that day. Um, the next day when it's time for math, he rips up two worksheets and looks ready to rip up a third. So I said that this was negative reinforcement because the consequence right after him ripping up the worksheet is not having to do the work anymore because she removed the worksheet. So something was removed from that environment right after the behavior and it increased. Um, the denial to do the math increased because the next day, or it could be a few hours later, when they represented that sheet, then he continued to rip it up because he had successfully escaped before. So although the teacher isn't trying to increase that non-compliance, she is because he's escape maintained and he doesn't want to do it. Um, another kind of easier example to grasp is one that I think of all the time as well. So when I was 16, my first car was a Pontiac Grand Am. And even though I was a teenager and probably a pain in the butt, I never wore my seatbelt. But there was a reason for that. So then I moved to Alaska and I bought a brand new car, first brand new car, and I immediately increased my seatbelt wearing. The reason I increased my seatbelt wearing is because in my new car, there was that obnoxious, super obnoxious beeping noise. And in my car, it gets faster and louder the longer that you wait to put your seatbelt on. However, if I don't want to listen to that beeping, I put my seatbelt on. <laughs> so I can remove that obnoxious beeping stimulus by increasing putting my seatbelt on. So that's a really easy example of removing something from an environment that then increases that behavior, okay? I'd say positive reinforcement is um, much more popular, popularly used in our field than negative, but we do use negative reinforcement. You can go to the next slide. All right, so positive reinforcement is anything added to the environment that's making it happen more frequently. So there's just a few points that we really want you to take home today, and that's probably the number one, is reinforcement makes behavior more likely to happen when it's provided right after the behavior that you're looking for. So it can be a whole lot of things. Um, I've worked in the field for 10 years now, and I've used some very weird reinforcers because they are very individualized for the clients that you're working with. Um, commonly these days, um, a lot of kids will work for cell phones if they're allowed to engage with them, um, tablets or iPads. Uh, a bunch of kids love praise. You know, uh, I love praise. <laughs> praise when you're using uh, when you're using it with clients on the spectrum. It is better to be descriptive in the praise that you're using. So if you're going to say good job, tell them why they're doing a good job because pretty soon you just hear good job, good job, good job all the time, and it's not as reinforcing as saying good job, staying in your seat, awesome job, washing your hands, things like that. Um, high fives can be reinforcing. A lot of times, uh, playing a game can be reinforcing um, game time after like a particularly hard program, tickles, small edibles, depending on the age, um, token, a token board, which Rachel's gonna talk a little bit more about later. Um, I've used a prize box a lot, especially if you have a child that might know what they're earning and then kind of perseverate over it because they want it in the last four to a thousand million times. Um, Prize boxes kind of take away what they're earning, but they still know they're earning something and they still have to be preferred items. Um, and then free time. My older kids, especially kids that I work with that are kind of preteens, really enjoy their free time where they don't have to be around adults all the time. Um, and those kids that are doing sessions at home a lot of the time, just kind of escaping into the room is reinforcing or playing video games, which we consider free time. So then more individualized reinforces I've used in the past. Um, hide and seek can be pretty popular. I've had different kids really love to play hide and seek, extra walks outside, um, sink and water play. I've had a few kids that really love that. Um, I had one girl that was highly, highly reinforced by sneezing. And so I got really good at fake sneezing. Um, 
and you know, if she completed a hard program or she was having a specially good day, it would seem like I had really terrible allergies because I would be sneezing all day. <laughs> um, and she would just laugh and laugh. Um, and then another one would be possibly, um, that's more a little bit defined is I, when I go to a house and I'm working with clients, a lot of times because preferences always change. Hold on one second. Um, I bring a Mary Poppins bag and I have a bunch of different reinforcers in there and I can kind of gauge their preferences that day, um, depending on how they're, they're um, appearing to me and what's in my Mary Poppins bag. So something really important to think about is that reinforcing properties are always changing, always, always changing. Um, in our field, I would can confidently say that we probably don't do preference assessments as much as we should um, because preferences are always changing. Um, and there are several reasons for this. There can be too much access to that reinforcer that they're working with. So for instance, I have a kid right now that I have an RB or a staff member working with them and they have come to me and said, I'm having a really hard time finding out what to reinforce this child with. And I said, well, you know, for the past couple of years, he's been working for free time. And she goes, okay, but he's asked to just keep working and not have the free time because the free time's not reinforcing enough. Um, and after a little more exploration, due to kind of what was going on in that household at the time, restrictions on preferred items in the house didn't really exist. Um, they kind of got free access to video games and different technologies and toys and everything that was motivating for them. Um, and because they didn't have restricted access to those items, they became satiated on what was reinforcing in that house and it limited those reinforcers. Um, so where prior to that, mom had said, you know, no video games until 7 p.m. and you can't play with your cell phone until all your homework's done. Once those restrictions were removed, um, the reinforcer became much less dependable because they were using it all the time and they became satiated. Um, something that will also kind of affect reinforcers is deprivation. So withholding the reinforcement for a while can make it more motivating when they're working for it in the future. So for that family, um, I had to go in and say, okay, you know, his most potent reinforcer is video games. Is there a way that we could restrict video games on the days that he has sessions until it's session time and then he can earn to engage in video games? Um, and that was an attempt to make video games more deprived and therefore more reinforcing. Um, immediacy, so is the faster the reinforcement is delivered for the behavior that you're looking for to increase, the better. Um, they say very quickly, like 0.5 seconds if possible. And then size, so how much of that reinforcer are you giving them? Um, how long are they engaging with it? And then um, kind of just, when are they engaging with it? So you might have a kid that'll sit on his tablet for two hours, but then you know you try to make them earn the tablet later on and they've been on it too long and it's not as reinforcing as it would be if they had only spent five minutes on it. Um, and then how much, I typically think um, of edibles when I think of how much of a reinforcer. If there is an edible that's extremely reinforcing, we need to give it in small little doses so that it continues to be reinforcing and they don't get satiated on it. Um, when I was at the May Center, I spent lots of time using pill cutters, cutting up Skittles and M&Ms. So I don't use so much edibles anymore. Um, so just keep in mind that um, the value of the reinforcer can change if the, it's an, it, especially if it's an edible um, and the child just ate. So if the child's not hungry and you're using edible reinforcement, your reinforcer isn't going to work as well. Um, it's also not going to work as well because it's possible that there's something else going on. Um, so the child could be sick, they could be tired, and that's going to change the effectiveness as, of the reinforcer as you're using it. Um, this isn't really a coined ABA term, so Rachel 
might not love this, but um, what I call those type of things like hunger or lack of sleep or um, being tired or illness, I call slow triggers, which in ABA world we call motivating operations. Um, but they kind of start way before the behavior, but they impact the reinforcer. Um, and it tends to affect the behavior in the long run. So all of those things can affect reinforcement are really important to keep in mind. All right, I think you can go forward. Yep. So how to identify um, reinforcers. There's something that we conduct, excuse me, <coughs> and it's called a preference assessment, and it's basically just a way to identify reinforcers. It sounds really easy, but sometimes it can be really difficult for some of our students and kids and clients to find reinforcers. Um, the easiest way is to observe what that kid is playing with in the environment. Um, sometimes we have kids that don't really engage in much. Um, that's when you gotta get a little more crafty. Um, but you can observe them in the environment and kind of see what they are engaging with. Um, if they are verbal, you can ask the learner what they want to work for. A lot of times this works. Um, if they're not verbal or they just don't tell you their preferences, you can ask their caregivers, their parents, their teachers, their other therapists, their siblings. Um, and then there are different types of actual assessments that you can run. And I'm not going to get into too many details about these, but there's two that are really easy. Um, there's one that's called a free operant which is pretty much just you place a bunch of toys down and out in the room and you record what they contact with first or how long they're engaging with a specific item. And then you can kind of rank the preference from there. Um, another preference assessment that you can do is a paired choice. And so this is really easy as well. You just give out two items and you have them pick one of those two items. And then if you want to rank them, you can also, you know, take the item that they picked and then take another item and put it in front of them and see if they pick that same one. And then you can rank how, how potent the reinforcer is. Um, I do a lot of ranking of my reinforcers and typically I do this because I, um, with my higher functioning kids, sometimes we'll have a point system or a, a leveled reinforcement system. So I will rank how preferred specific items are. So for, hmm, for, you know, Jimmy, he's super, super reinforced by Sour Patch. So I'm going to save the Sour Patch for the biggest goal, the skill that the family wants to see the most improvement on, um, and what will impact, you know, his quality of life the most. And I'm going to save that reinforcer for that program and try not to let him access Sour Patch outside of that time. Um, but for other kids that I might be leveling, you know, they can have a great day and they can have an okay day and they can have, you know, not a good day. Um, and so for a great day, they might be able to earn their top three reinforcers. And, you know, this is all very defined what a great day and a good day and a not good day is. Um, and then they can access their most potent reinforcers if they can get the points for that day. Um, and if they have an okay day, then they get access to that middle reinforcer that's not their favorite, but they'll still work for it. Um, so when you rank preferences, that can really help identify what will work the best as a reinforcer. Um, depending on the child or the student, sometimes finding good reinforcement can be extremely difficult. Uh, I typically give this example out when I talk about reinforcement because sometimes there are students out there that it's very hard to find reinforcers for. That doesn't mean they don't have reinforcers, it just means we have to get really creative. Um, so there was a client that I had for a few years here and he didn't have the best leisure skills. Um, we tried a bunch of different things, but there wasn't a lot that would really motivate him to work. Um, but something he did like to do was a self-stimulatory behavior, and he would play with dirt um, and kind of rub it through his fingers. He lived kind of far away 
Um, and where he lived, there was a lot of silt. So it's that very, very fine sand. And he would just kind of watch it blow through his fingers a lot. Um, and although it wasn't extremely functional, it was reinforcing to him. And I felt that we could make that a functional skill that was reinforcing to him. So we actually turned that into him being able to fill planters with dirt and being able to engage with the dirt um, as a reinforcer for doing his work. And that was successful for him. Um, but with that being very, with that being said, um, there are some really great resources out there that you can use to help try to guide um, people to find different preferences. So the next couple slides are. Um, different lists for possible reinforcers. So in this one, uh, this one's kind of cool because you kind of do a Likert scale for the kid um, to see what they would like, but it's just kind of got a bunch of self-care skills in there. Um, and then this one is pretty simple too. Um, some of the stuff you wouldn't think of right away to be reinforcing, but it's really good to try it because the delivering verbal praise is a much easier reinforcer than other things. Um, and then I think the next one is the reinforcer. Oh, nope, it's the one after that. Um, this is another list of activities that also kind of has a Likert scale to it. Um, and I believe these are from Essentials for Living. Could be wrong on that. Um, and then the last list is actually one that I use quite often. And when I take on a new client with the CBC, I typically give them a packet that has this reinforcer list attached and I have the caregivers or sometimes the clients go through and either test these or check off ones that they know are actively reinforcing. Um, and this is a list, I wanna say it's got like 150 items on it. And um, there's definitely some items in there you wouldn't think of unless you saw it written down. And that's why I think this one is really helpful. Um, I think this one's the most helpful with uh, kids where you're really struggling to find some preferences. Um, so with using, Rachel, I actually had you doing this one, but I can talk about it. <laughs> um, using reinforcement, we accidentally reinforced behavior without intending to on a regular basis. So the first examples that I gave you with the maladaptive behavior would be reinforcing behavior when we really didn't want to. Um, and this is really, really common. We don't always know when we're reinforcing behavior. I said earlier, I have a two-year-old. There are multiple times a day when I'm like, whoop, just reinforce that tantrum. Um, so it, it's very easy to make mistakes and we make mistakes very often, but uh, with our clients, especially those on the spectrum, reinforcing the wrong thing can uh, really increase the behaviors that we don't wanna see. So we think about a store with a three-year-old who wants a cookie and then when told no cookie today, starts yelling and hitting. If we go ahead and give the kid the cookie, we escape the big tantrum, we're not embarrassed, um, but we probably really just reinforce that behavior because next time I bring my kid to the store and he wants a cookie, he is gonna throw a tantrum to get one because last time he tantrumed and he did get a cookie. Um, so reinforcing the wrong behaviors happen very often. And this is a good example, probably the most common example of kind of giving in in the moment um, to, and sometimes we do, we can't win every battle, um, but it's a good example of when you have kind of, when you're trying to escape something very aversive, a lot of times we can reinforce the behavior that we're trying to reduce, so. Great, thank you so much, Becky. Um, we are going to now talk about um, what we can do to more effectively use reinforcement. Um, Becky presented a couple of examples where uh, behaviors are being reinforced and maybe unintentionally we're increasing a behavior that we would like to actually decrease. So the important thing about reinforcement is that it increases behavior and that it could be a variety of things, even things that we wouldn't necessarily think should be 
valuable to that learner. Um, how do we use reinforcement effectively? The first thing is that we want to go back and we want to identify um, function of inappropriate behavior. So last week our webinar talked about the functions of behavior and Becky reviewed those here. It's the everybody eats, so escape, attention, tangible, or self-stimulatory. Um, so if we're addressing an inappropriate behavior, we do want to make sure that we are determining what the function of that behavior is, what's the learner getting out of it, because that can give us a clue as to what's valuable to this learner, especially given that particular situation. Um, the next thing is, uh, as, as Becky pointed out, that we want to identify what the preferred items or activities are for this learner. Uh, there are a variety of reinforcement checklists um, and lists just to kind of get you brainstorming. Sometimes when you say, well, what are some things that the learner likes? We think, okay, well, they like this kind of food and they like this kind of toy and we might be able to think of five or six things um, and then we're like and that's it but if we use some of these we can come up with a variety of different things that we didn't even think about um, she gave some great examples of some uh, rather unusual reinforcers like sneezing um, that's a fun one uh, pretending to sneeze um, other items or activities that the learner finds valuable and can function as reinforcers. If you are interested in some of those reinforcer checklists, just send me an email. It's rachel at alaskachd.org and it'll be on the last slide as well. And I can share those reinforcer checklists with you that we showed screenshots of. Um, the next thing in order to use reinforcement effectively is we wanna identify those behaviors that we are trying to increase. If we want to change behavior, we need to be specific about what behaviors we're changing. If we think about new skills, it might be um, using the toilet, and that's a brand new skill that the learner has never engaged in before, and we want to increase that uh, use, appropriate toileting use. Um, so we could identify that as one of our skills that we're working on. It could also be those replacement behaviors that we talked about in last week's webinar, um, where we are trying to teach the learner a more socially appropriate way to get their needs met instead of the inappropriate behavior that they have been using in the past. So if our learner was engaging in behavior to escape the math worksheet, um, we might identify a couple of replacement behaviors such as asking for a break, asking for help, asking to do part of the worksheet um, and save the rest for later, or maybe asking to um, work out the problems with manipulatives instead of having to write it down on the worksheet or maybe answer it verbally instead of having to write it if it's the writing of the worksheet part that is um, challenging for the learner. So those would be examples of replacement behaviors that we want to increase for that learner. Um, then in order to really make sure we're all increasing the same behavior, we wanna be really specific as to what those behaviors are. And Becky talked about this a little bit, where you want to identify specifically what that looks like for the learner. So what does having a good day look like? Um, maybe it is uh, responding to instructions the first time. Maybe it is um, completing the after school routine with only one reminder. Um, it could be appropriate use of niceties, like saying please and thank you. We'd want to identify specifically what behaviors we're looking to increase and then make sure that we're all delivering reinforcement when that appropriate behavior occurs. Now we have to define in, in detail what that behavior is so that we can make sure that we reinforce it and deliver those fun or preferred activities when that behavior occurs. Um, 
Becky talked about this too, so this will be a little bit of a review. Um, but here is the acronym that she was describing, and it's DISC, D-I-S-C. Um, so these are four things that we want to consider when we are attempting to use something as a reinforcer. So this something could be our praise or our attention. It could also be a tangible, an item or a candy or something that the learner gets access to. Um, it could also be breaks. So we'll kind of talk through what those look like as we go through. Um, so the D stands for deprivation. Um, we want to make sure that the thing that we're using or the item or the activity that um, is going to be used as a reinforcer is something that the learner doesn't have access to on a free basis. Um, if the learner can play video games whenever they want, then they're not very likely to be motivated to work for video games because they can already get video games. Um, if I can walk over to the counter and eat as many cookies as I want, I'm really not likely to work for those cookies because I already have free access to them. However, if it's something that I can't get um, by myself and someone else can kind of control that access, or it's something that costs money, hinting ahead to our token systems, that I have to earn and have enough of something to trade in, then that's one way that we can ensure that the item is not so freely available that it's not motivating. If you attended last week's webinar, we talked about one way to reduce the likelihood of inappropriate behavior is to give it as much as possible. So we can reduce the likelihood that a behavior is going to occur if we already provide access to the thing that it's trying to get. And this is the same thing in reverse. We can't motivate someone to work to earn something if they already have it in their environment. There's no motivation for that behavior to occur. So D stands for deprivation. And we just wanna make sure that any items that we're using are reserved or special or less available except for the behaviors that we're trying to reinforce. I stands for immediacy. So we want to deliver the reinforcer as immediately as possible um, in order to increase the correct behavior. The best example that I always give when I'm training um, staff to work with providers is you tell Johnny, clap your hands. Johnny claps his hands. You say, great job, Johnny. You turn around, you pick up the toy, and you hand it back to him, and Johnny's got his finger up his nose. Well, you may have accidentally reinforced finger up your nose instead of following the instruction to clap your hands. Because even in those few seconds, um, the learner may engage in other behaviors that then when your uh, reward and reinforcer comes out are likely to increase that behavior. So the closer in time things are, the more impact they're going to have. Um, now, as the learner is older or more verbal or maybe more used to a delay in that delivery of reinforcers, um, then you won't have to be as fast. But you need to guarantee that they really understand that component. So certainly with new skills, you want to make sure that you're reinforcing right away. Uh, the next thing to consider, S stands for size. Um, so the size is the amount of the reinforcer. If we're talking cookies, we might actually be talking about the size of the bite. How much of the cookie did you give? Um, but for the same, uh, the, the size is still an important feature even for other types of reinforcers. If we're talking about access to video games or electronic time, um, we're talking about how much time they have. Um, breaks would be the same way. How long of a break did they have? Um, also, what you get for your money is kind of where this comes in. Um, if I have to um, do 15 things and all I get is a fraction of a Skittle, I don't know that I'm motivated to do 15 things for a fraction of a Skittle. 
For me, I might need a Skittle, a full Skittle or two. Um, so you also have to look at um, whether the size is reasonable for the amount of work that you're asking or the difficulty of that skill. Um, I don't go to movies very often, um, partly because I feel like movies are too expensive to just sit there and watch something that I could wait, you know, a few extra months and watch it on Netflix for way cheaper. Um, so for me, it's not worth it to pay $15 to go to a movie, um, but you know, it might be worth it to pay $2 to go to a movie. So you've got to evaluate the size, the price, how much work you're asking the learner to do, how difficult, how hard that skill is for the learner, and making sure that the size of the reinforcer is valuable enough. Not too small, but also not too big so that the learner doesn't satiate or habituate and, you know, get tired of that reinforcer. The last letter is C for contingency. Um, basically what this means is that they can earn the reinforcer when and only when that targeted appropriate behavior occurs. Um, if they can get a treat um, after school, regardless of what they did during school, then the treat is not gonna function as a reinforcer for appropriate school behaviors. Um, there is, uh, I, I worked with a family where they were delivering a sucker um, after school if the learner wrote her name quickly when she signed in at school. Well, the problem was is that mom confessed to me, is like, well, they really were going to give her the treat anyway, regardless of how she did. And so we just discussed that in that case, let's not say that that's what it's for. You know, if it's, this is a treat because you want to give her a treat, great. Um, let's use something else if we're trying to increase the speed with which she is writing her name at school. So contingency basically just means that they're earning it for the appropriate behavior. Um, they're not getting it for other reasons. Um, and they can only get it when they engage in that appropriate behavior. So some other ways we can use reinforcement. Um, I believe we touched upon this in the last webinar as well about using a praise to reprimand ratio. Now I'm gonna talk about four to one praise to reprimand because that's the research that I've done personally. There are a few other ratios out there. The idea is that way more attention and praise to appropriate behavior than inappropriate behavior. This is an awesome strategy for attention maintained behavior. So those learners and those behaviors that are sensitive to our attention or our reaction are going to benefit from you changing and using a four to one praise to reprimand ratio. Um, basically what it is, is it's four instances of positive attention for appropriate behavior to every one instance of correction or redirection for the inappropriate behavior. Now it's not always super easy to do, um, but the overall idea is that the environment in which the kid lives, so the people that the kid interacts with, are going to attend um, to appropriate behaviors way more frequently than those inappropriate behaviors. So for those learners that seek out attention and kind of don't care whether it's praise attention or reprimand attention, it's still easier for them to get attention by doing the appropriate behavior because more often than not, those appropriate behaviors are going to get some reinforcement, some attention from the adults or the other people in that learner's environment. Whereas the inappropriate behaviors are not going to get um, immediate attention or are not going to get attention as easily. Um, so that doesn't mean that you completely ignore the inappropriate behavior. What it really means in practice is that you focus on 
praising and attending to all of the things that they do right um, so that when you do need to correct or redirect an inappropriate behavior, there's all these other opportunities that you've already um, provided attention and praise for. There's a couple of different ways that that could look. In a classroom setting with multiple individuals, if the teacher says, um, okay, everybody, it's time to line up, and um, several of the kids line up, and one child does not line up, the teacher could praise individually each of those children that are lined up. Johnny, thanks for lining up. Susie, thanks for lining up. Um, I love how you lined up, Karen. And then they could redirect the learner. Um, Billy, please get in line. And then when Billy lines up, Billy, thanks for following my directions. So overall, that instance of lining up, there were four positive comments to the one negative comment or the one redirection. And overall, that means that the classroom or that activity is receiving, learners are receiving attention for appropriate behaviors more often than the inappropriate behaviors. Um, that's in a classroom setting. With regards to an individual, and you would want to make sure that each individual, you're not only targeting one kid with your redirections and praising everybody else, um, but that that learner, once they are in line, once they are doing what they're supposed to be doing, you're praising them. And you might need to praise them more often than you would normally. Sometimes we have the expectation that um, individuals should do things just because they're the right thing to do or because um, that's what's expected. And certainly, most of our typically developing learners get to that point where they understand the social norms, they understand the expectations, and they engage in the appropriate behaviors in order to maintain access to that social environment. However, if we're talking specifically about learners with autism or other developmental delays, they may not be there yet. It may take more support and more practice and extra reinforcers for them to get to the point where they value that social interaction and that social environment more. So just like we talked about where reinforcers could be anything, um, you may need to pair your praise along with something else, or you may need to just deliver more attention and a higher rate of praise to some individuals than others in order to help change those behaviors. So, moving on to token systems. So we're gonna try out something new. I'm going, going to issue a poll um, so if you are using a computer, you should have a poll that popped up and it asks, have you used a token system before? Um, if you uh, can answer, go ahead and do that. If you're unable to answer in the poll, um, then feel free to type into chat. Um, or if this just isn't working for you, if you're attending on phone, then just hang out and we'll go over things. Um, so I see that some people are able to access this, and so that's great, testing out new systems with our technology. Maybe we'll do more polls in the future. Um, most people are saying, yes, they have used a token system before. So that's fantastic. We're going to go over a token system, the ways to use tokens uh, most effectively, and um, I'm going to show you some examples. Um, because this is, I think, one of the simplest ways to help uh, remind yourself, maybe, and help our learners to work for um, reinforcers for a little bit longer. All right, so I'm going to close the poll now. Thank you guys very much. Um, all right, so tokens. Um, Sometimes those items or activities that we discover that our learners really prefer are not always available. Um, the example Becky gave of like 
using the potting soil or the sand and, and engaging in an activity that was hands-on, you know, gardening kinds of um, uh, sensory, I don't know how to say it, <laughs> reinforcement. There you go. Um, you might not always have that available. Um, if you're riding the city bus, you might not be able to carry around a potted plant with you in order to do that. So sometimes those items or activities um, just can't be available all the time. Um, sometimes you can't always stop and reinforce every single individual behavior. Um, like we just talked about with the praise, um, we want our learners to get to a point where they don't need somebody right there next to them, giving them a Skittle and praising them every time they do each individual appropriate behavior. We want to get them to the point where they are functioning um, in the natural environment with the levels of reinforcement, natural reinforcement that are available. So we need to have a plan to fade out those unnatural reinforcers. Praise is a fairly natural reinforcer. Um, we'll talk about some other token systems that are pretty common and are part of our society. So there are some things that may stay in place that we don't need to fade out um, the use of. But, you know, playing in dirt, um, maybe having those Skittles, things like that are probably things that are not always available and not something that we want um, to have to deliver after every single behavior. Um, we also need to look at fading our reinforcement to a level where it's manageable in the environment. Um, one of the uh, things that I often hear when we start talking about, well, we need to, you know, give this learner more attention, they need more praise, they need these items, is that that is a very difficult schedule for the implementer, whether that's a parent, a caregiver, a provider, or a teacher, to do as well as continue to do all of the other things that they have to do. Um, if I were to tell you that, you know, in order to stop your child from engaging in inappropriate behavior, you needed to deliver attention in the form of a praise statement every 30 seconds, um, you would probably say, that sounds great, but how am I going to do anything else? I can't cook dinner if I have to be commenting constantly on what my learner is doing. I can't do laundry. I can't go grocery shopping. Um, so we need to make sure that we can fade the reinforcers and the rate of reinforcement to a rate that is manageable for the environment. Um, now, when we start talking about this, Sometimes we do have to start at, at more of an unnatural, um, short-term manageable level and then fade that out in order for our learner to learn the new skill and contact that reinforcer and those natural consequences so that they can be successful. But one way that we can start fading things out is by using token boards. Um, so, for those of you that have used token, token boards before, consider this a review and, and maybe um, we can give you some more ideas on how to um, vary your token boards or make them more successful. And for those of you that haven't used token boards before, let me introduce them to you. Um, so, tokens, the idea behind a token board is that you are giving a token, something that is meaningless by itself, um, but you're delivering those tokens so that they can pay them and spend them later on an item or activity that is more preferred. Um, in this example here, this picture, it has I am working for and it has a little icon of a computer. Um, and then there are stars, there are two star, stars on the board, and there are three more blank spaces. So the idea behind this token board would be that the learner needs to earn three more stars, and then they can trade it in for access to the computer. 
So remember when I said we needed to specify what behaviors we were targeting? Um, we still need to specify exactly what behaviors we're reinforcing with tokens. Um, we also can specify what preferred item or activity the learner is working for in advance. Um, Though sometimes we have those learners that they just want to work for a break, and that's okay. Um, we don't have to specify what they're working for. They can choose what it is that they would like to spend their points or their tokens on um, when they earn it completely. So, actually, I'm going to go back. I'm going to show you um, some examples here. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to... Stop the screen share. Um, now, you should be able to see me a little bit bigger on your screen. Um, so, for example, this is a first then kind of icon. Um, we could put in the picture of the work under the first category. Then there's the arrow, and we can put in the picture of the item that they are earning. In this case, I would say this isn't like a full token board in the sense that they're earning one thing and then get the next, but you could use it where they pull down the activity that they're supposed to do and then they um, come back and they pull down the reward once they complete it. Um, you could also um, use cute little characters all lined up. Um, if they prefer certain types of items, we just like to Velcro things, laminate them and Velcro, and, and you can pretty much make anything a token board. <laughs> um, so it could be icons um, or pictures of preferred um, characters to make a token board. Um, we've also done um, where they're a bit more... Um, Fanciful, I think this was scrapbooking material, and then we did a hole punch, one of those big fat scrapbooking hole punches, and then um, stick the Velcro on a board. Um, in this case, when the dots are not there, there's, um, there's a Velcro backing so they can see how many more they need to earn in order to cash in. And those could come in a variety of um, designs and a variety of amounts as far as tokens go. These are just examples of things that we've made. Um, there are other examples of tokens, and some of you um, may be familiar with the fact that uh, token systems um, can also include money. So we all actually operate on a, a token system. Um, we go to work and we get our paycheck and then we use that money to buy the things that we really would like. Um, money in and of itself is not very valuable. It's only valuable when you can purchase the things that you really do want and need with that. So money is an example of a token system that we use that would be very natural and if you're talking about using a token system especially with uh, learners that are um, middle school high school uh, adults um, money would make sense because it's also teaching them the value of money so that then they can um, learn to participate more within their community also if any of you have um, typically developing uh, teenagers, I feel like every teenager values money more than almost anything else. Um, so it's also a very socially appropriate um, token system to use. Alternately, you could also just have a piece of paper and do tallies and count up how many points. And then at certain times when those points are available to be cashed in, then they can spend those points. Um, when Becky was talking earlier about ranking the um, preferences, um, it might be that some of those highly preferred items uh, cost more points than the medium preferred items. So they could um, save up their money for longer for those bigger items, 
or they could get something more immediate, but it's not necessarily as highly prized. And that can encourage things like saving. Um, uh, if any of you have been to uh, Chuck E. Cheese or Dave and Buster's, those kinds of places that you play games, you get points, and then you trade in those points or those tickets for items um, in their shop. Um, the, the nicer items, the ones that you might actually want, cost a lot. <laughs> they cost a lot of points and you'd have to save up quite a bit. Um, but in that way, the uh, store is um, reinforcing your coming and spending money on their games behavior so that you can earn more points to buy the things that they um, want you to spend more points on. So when would we use a token board? Um, it's really beneficial to use a token board uh, I'm sorry, when to use a token board. When you are starting with a new skill, um, it's important to reinforce the behavior after every occurrence. So if I'm teaching a brand new skill, such as the toilet training example, um, at first, every time my learner uses the toilet appropriately, I'm gonna give them the item, um, in Becky's case, the Pez. I'm gonna give them the Pez for every successful use in the toilet. However, um, I don't want my learner to only go to the toilet when there's Pez available, or to expect that there will be Pez upon every time that you go to the toilet. Um, so we have to start to fade to a more natural frequency, which if we're using the toilet training example, would be that you go because you don't want to pee your pants, not because someone's going to give you a treat. However, we have to start with what two-year-olds are motivated by. And, and having toilet trained a couple of my own children as well, it's usually candy. That's usually where we start. Um, so if we were going to start with um, toilet training, um, we might start with delivering the um, Pez, the candy, um, for every success. But at some point, we want to start fading that out. One way to fade that out would be to introduce the use of a token board. Um, because then we're providing a visual representation of when that um, candy or when that reinforcer is going to be earned. Um, I think it's my next slide. Um, well, okay, I'm gonna talk about it now and then if I repeat myself later, um, so be it. So, um, as an example, um, I might start with, Here we go, playing around with technology. So I might start by having just one item off of my token board. And then instead of when my learner uses the toilet, instead of giving them the Pez right away, I say, oh, great job, you use the toilet. Here's your token, here, put it right here. And just kind of prompt them through it. And then, oh, you got all your tokens, here's your Pez. Here's your candy. Um, and then over time, I can fade out how many tokens before the candy becomes available. And they can see how many times they need to be successful before they can earn that, um, that Pez again. Um, alternately, you could also use a token board um, to kind of pace the timing. Once the learner understands the concept of a token board, then if I want my learner, I've done this with my own kid, to sit through church um, without being disruptive. And it's not even that long before the kids get dismissed anyway. But to sit through that activity without being disruptive, um, I pulled out a little sticky note that I had in my purse. I drew little boxes with a pen and I told her that if she um, had all of the stars filled in, um, she could have dessert or have a treat after we left um, church. 
So, so we sat there and I told her ahead of time, I was like, okay, so um, I'm going to give you a star as long as you're sitting quietly. And I know there's about 10 minutes before the kids go down. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna draw 10 little boxes. I'm gonna try and deliver um, a star about once every minute, um, so long as she's sitting calmly um, at that time, so that I can kind of pace it. She's motivated, she sees that she's making progress, and it kind of marks that passage of time for her. Um, so token boards can also, um, delay that time if something's not available right now but you can use a token board to sort of pace the appropriate waiting behaviors that you need them to engage in until that reinforcement is available all right so we've kind of actually talked about a couple of these um, so a token system is highly customizable um, it basically just needs to um, identify um, either how many more tokens are needed to purchase something or um, if you are working off of a points system where there's uh, prizes available at any level then when that um, option to buy in is available um, so you need to know um, that basically the learner needs to know how much more work is needed, how much more do they need to do in order to get to um, what they want. So how many more spaces, how many more tokens do they need before they can get what they're working for. Um, you can include, like in our picture example, what they're working for at the time, but you could also just um, let them choose at the end or deliver something um, that they've selected and it's just not marked on their token board. Um, it can be different materials for different ages. A lot of the examples that I gave you with these um, very tangible physical tokens are um, usually used with earlier learners. So when you're first introducing the concept of a token board, um, you might do something very tangible that they can put their hands on, especially if it's a learner who's already been used to earning an item. So in our toileting case, since he's already used to getting a thing when he goes to the bathroom, having a thing um, that he receives when he goes is very similar and can help bridge that and make that connection between the, the purpose of a token. As opposed to if you just started um, marking tally marks, those probably have even less meaning and, and even less value than receiving an, a thing that he can hold. Um, however, as people become familiar with token systems, you can make them points, you can use money, um, you can have check marks kind of on a, a to-do list. I make a to-do list at the beginning of my day and then I mark things off as I complete them. And if I was going to reinforce myself, um, uh, or if somebody else was going to deliver a reinforcer, they would look at my to-do list, and if everything's marked off, then I get my reinforcer. Um, personally, I've been doing it so long, and, and I just get the satisfaction of marking stuff off as done. Um, but that's an example of being learning it and being exposed to those natural contingencies so that then the natural contingency of marking things off and, and having that personal satisfaction of having it done um, is reinforcing in and of itself. So you might need to start with uh, tokens to get them there. It could also be a calendar. Um, sometimes uh, they make these cute um, magnetic boards that the kids have chores on, or you can buy them at, at kids' stores and they're a, a fold out um, chart where you can put stickers on for each day that you were successful. That can also be an example of a token system. Um, over time, as you increase, um, you're going to deliver those tokens or points, whatever it is that you're doing, um, less per off, uh, less often. Um, so not necessarily um, every single time the behavior occurs. Um, it occurs uh, less. 
you you reward it with a token maybe every other time or every couple of times it occurs and then when they cash in or are able to trade in those tokens you also um, fade out how frequently that's available um, so when I if I wanted to teach a learner about money and learning an allowance uh, or earning an allowance I might start with having them do a couple of chores I pay them their dollar or two and then we immediately go to the dollar store so that they can cash that in and buy something that they want but over time we're not gonna make daily trips to the dollar store instead we'll start okay we'll go um every couple of days or we'll go at the end of the week or we'll go a couple of times a month and the learner needs to save that money for when it is time to cash it in um another variation or or way that you could go about this um, especially for learners that are are very verbal understand um, and can uh, and or are approaching transition age where they're about to go into adulthood and we want to teach them the importance of when you put your name on something um, you've signed it and you agree to it you might use something like a behavioral contract um, Basically, a behavioral contract is going to spell out what the expectations are and what the rewards are. Um, and then you guys sign it and then you can look back to it and, and mark off your progress or revisit that um, at the end of the week and see whether or not things have been met. Pairing a behavioral contract with some sort of a point system um, might be very helpful to get started um, but eventually you could fade it again to where it's like here's my expectations of you here's what you earn when you complete those things and then the learner self monitors um, how they are doing um, towards their progress but that's a bit of a more advanced skill I'm just throwing it out there because you know I don't know the age or skill abilities of the individuals that you work with so we're going to cover a wide variety. Um, okay, yeah, here's my slide on how to start a token system. Um, important thing is that when you start a token system, you want to make sure that you're starting small enough to ensure the success. If the first time, I'm going to keep, Becky, I'm going to keep using your toileting example because it's perfect and lots of people do use sticker charts when they're toilet training young children. Um, if we were to take the two-year-old who is used to getting a Pez every time he uses the toilet and then suddenly stick a sticker chart up on the wall and say, okay, you need 20 stickers before you can get your Pez um, and you only get a sticker when you go in the toilet for a whole day with no accidents, we're pretty much setting up um, this kid for failure. Like, there's no way that he's going to get from going, getting a Pez every single time to now waiting, I don't know, how many times does a child go during the day? Maybe four, five, six, ten times a day for 20 days? Um, he's never going to get there, and he's never going to reach it, and he's never going to contact that reinforcer, so you can't actually reinforce the behavior because he's never actually earning it. So you have to start small, which is why I love to just start with you know you're already getting a Pez one for one now we're just gonna do a token and you hand it right back and then here's your Pez so we're gonna start really small where they're already successful um, if the learner already has some familiarity with token systems um, or point systems you don't have to start back at one but you do need to make sure that they are able to earn it um, so one way you can do this is look at the frequency of how often that behavior is occurring already. So if it's already occurring at low levels, um, so maybe raising their hand, right? If we want them to raise their hand instead of calling out at class. Um, if they raise their hand sometimes, then we might start with a reinforcer system that requires five times of raising their hand because they're already engaging it at some level. Um, 
And that way we can deliver it when they're already starting to engage with that behavior um, so that they see that that's how they're earning it. And then they can continue along that path and they can cash in rather quickly. Um, however, if our learner is uh, starting on a brand new skill, we want to reinforce every time. So we probably want to keep it at, at a one for one um, and then slowly move it up to two. Um, so instead of making a token board that only has one token on it or two tokens on it, you can start, I mean, you could start with a token board that has 12 things on it. Oh, that's 10. 10 things on it. Um, and you would just leave the board full and only peel off the ones that they need to earn. So we're using the board um, that require, you know, that has 10 tokens on it, but they only need to earn three before they get to cash in. So you just take those three off and then you deliver them. Um, with point systems, when there's not something physical in their hand, um, you want to start small and make those opportunities to cash it in um, pretty frequent. So um, if we're talking like a school day, for example, maybe at the end of each class period or at the end of each hour, they get to um, purchase a small little um, prize from the prize box with the points they have so far versus over time, we can make that available maybe every other hour, maybe twice a day, so before lunch and before you go home, then once a day before you go home, and then you know once or twice a week. Um, some of the schools have like a school store where the kids are earning points and then they can go and cash those in for prizes from the school store. And from what I can tell, most of the times those school stores are only open like once a week, um, once the system is in place. So that might be where you'd work up to with the learner. Um, just to, you know, put it out there, fading reinforcement can sometimes be challenging. Um, we might say, okay, well, they're getting it with two tokens. I'm going to jump up to five tokens. And we might see that the behavior um, decreases or isn't quite as reliable or we see some inappropriate behavior start to creep back up again. Um, and it could be that that's just a little bit too much work for them right now. You might need to go up gradually, two tokens, then three tokens, then four tokens before you're able to get up to five tokens. Um, it really does depend upon the learner. It depends upon the skill. Um, you want to make sure that they're able to be successful um, without making it a freebie. Um, but you want to make sure that you're basing how you're changing it on their performance. Um, so you don't want to go ahead and just script out, okay, we're going to do two days of two tokens and then three days of five tokens and then, um, the, and then we're at the 20 token um, board. Like, the learner may not be able to still be successful at that level. So you might need to make gradual changes instead. Um, and your ultimate goal should be to aim for a frequency that's similar to the natural environment. Um, however, it may take some time to get there. Um, like I said, with the school stores, those may be available once a week. So you might build up to your learner being able to cash in once a week for their um, for their prizes at school. Um, I don't know about your families, but we tend to go to the grocery store on the weekend. So once a week would be an appropriate um, amount of time if I wanted my children to um, save up their money, and then they could buy something at the store. That would be once a week. So we would work up to a once a week kind of schedule. However, you do need to make sure that it is often enough for the learner to stay motivated, but not so rare that there's problem behavior occurring. Um, and that's the challenge. Um, and, and that's where, you know, we go back to, um, especially learners with autism, but other learners, even without a diagnosis, um, may just need more. It may take them longer for you to be able to um, 
fade out to a more natural environment um, uh, rate of reinforcement. They may just need more reinforcement. They may need it for longer. Um, part of that is um, due to the nature of the diagnosis. If we're talking about autism, they don't necessarily respond to the natural social environment in the same way. Um, and so it can take longer for them to learn to. Um, but the goal is, is that if you're using reinforcement for those appropriate behaviors, even if you're having to do it at a high rate um, or a higher rate than you would prefer, you are still supporting increasing an appropriate behavior instead of having to stop and manage an inappropriate behavior when it occurs on the learner's terms. Um, one of the best things about re reinforcement is that if you're focusing on what to reinforce, then you are capitalizing on those opportunities um, to improve the behavior on your terms and not have to always drop everything and respond to those inappropriate behaviors on the learner's terms because you've got to focus um, that you're working on and, and helping them to improve in that way. Um, so if you're going to sit down and you want to start a token system, you want to identify what behaviors are going to earn a token um, so that you know, so that your learner knows what you expect and any other people that might be participating in delivering points are all on the same page. Um, if I say, uh, as, as Becky's example earlier, had a good day, if one provider if one provider's definition of have a good day is following instructions right away and another um, behavior's definition or another provider's definition of having a good day is saying please and thank you, um, they might label some days as good and, and bad differently from each other because the learner might have followed the instructions but not said please and thank you. So one person would say it was a good day and another one would say it was not a good day. So you need to describe a, and outline what behaviors are going to learn uh, to earn a token. Um, if your learner has um, receptive language and can understand what you're telling them, even if they can't say it back, um, you can explain to the learner what it is that you expect. Um, so it's not that I want you to be good at school, it's that I want you to follow directions, do your work, and um, share with your friends. You know, I might break it down that way. And then the learner knows specifically what behaviors you're looking for. When you deliver that token, you can pair it with praise. Nice job cleaning your room. Nice job sharing with your friends. Thank you for following directions the first time. So then they hear it again as to what you are expecting and what appropriate behavior you're looking for. And that also counts as a praise statement if we're looking at four to one praise to reprimand ratios. Um, you also need to specify what can be bought with those tokens. What are they working for? And this is where that preference assessment comes back in. Um, if the learner can tell you, let them choose what they'd like to earn or have a variety of things on a choice board or on a menu board or um, with one learner that I worked with, we took pictures of her engaging in different activities, and then she could select from the picture um, which ones she wanted to do because she couldn't vocally express what she would like to do. But we had pictures of her on the slide, on the swings, being spun around, being tickled, things like that, so that she was like, oh yeah, that was fun, that's the one I wanna do. So we'd have her pull from a, um, it, was a it was like a coupon box, and it just had tons of photos of all the things that she liked to do. And so she could select that way. Um, another thing that's important um, is uh, if you can, getting your learners uh, learner to help identify what um, uh, what those to what they can earn and maybe how much they cost. 
Um, again, if your learner is able to participate um, and you can ask them, okay, so we're gonna earn points and here's some things that you like to do. Um, how many points do you think you should earn in order to get iPad time or movie time? Um, and you can let them have some say in that. Um, now your first thought might be that they're gonna say, oh, I should, I should only have to earn one or two. Um, in my experience, um, if I'm able to sit down and have this conversation with a learner, oftentimes they're really fairly honest and reasonable in the costs, you know? Well, that's kind of big, so they give it a kind of higher number. Um, the other thing that you can do is that even if your learner says, well, that, you know, I think it should only cost five points, and they're thinking, okay, that can be pretty easy, then what you can do is you can um, vary the, um, the frequency with which you deliver those points. So, you know, if they say, oh, it's 200 points, well, and I want them to make sure that they're earning this about once a week, I might be handing out those points pretty frequently. However, if they say it's five points and I want them to earn it about once a week, I might only hand out a point a day or so. So you can kind of play around with how much you're giving the points and still let them sort of um, set or, or negotiate for certain uh, price tags on those items. Um, one other thing to remember when we're talking about token systems is that we're not removing tokens. Um, that's a different procedure. It's called a response cost. It's a punishment procedure and there are entirely different rules um, if you're gonna take away points. So this is not a, a system where we're taking away points. Um, we're talking about reinforcement. We're not gonna delve into to punishment um, because uh, you know, behavior analytically, our focus is on increasing behaviors through positive reinforcement or um, negative reinforcement when it's appropriate, but we're increasing um, appropriate behaviors. We're not working on um, punishing inappropriate behaviors. Um, so this is not talking about removing tokens. We don't wanna to take tokens away. It just is gonna take them longer to earn what they, uh, wanted to earn um, if they are not engaged in the appropriate behavior. It's just gonna take longer. All right, um, so I've actually kind of touched upon this too, um, jumping around all over the place. So schedules of reinforcement. Um, we've talked about how to use reinforcement. We've talked about token systems, praise to, uh, four to one praise to reprimand ratios. Um, but when we talk about how often are we delivering those reinforcers, it's gonna vary depending upon the skill. So for new skills, we want to reinforce every time that appropriate behavior occurs. Um, we may even reinforce for the display of a skill even if we prompted them or helped them to complete it in the beginning. Because again, we want to increase the likelihood that they're trying to use that appropriate skill, um, that they're using that appropriate skill more frequently than maybe an inappropriate behavior um, that this is supposed to replace. Um, so we want to make sure that we're reinforcing it as often as we can, as often as it is occurring. Um, if you go to um, Dave & Buster's, I'll use that as an example because we were there not that long ago. If you go to Dave & Buster's and you play a game and you, um, you try it and you don't get any tickets from it um, or any points from it, you may not be willing to try it again. You might want to move on to a game that you're more likely to get tickets or points from. Um, versus if you go to a game and even though it's new to you, you try a new game, but you get some points for um, engaging with the game. Even if you lose, you're getting points. That can increase your likelihood to stick with the game if you're motivated by earning points to, to get a prize. Um, so even if you're not 100% successful, the fact is that you're trying and you're being rewarded for that attempt um, or that occasional use of that skill, even if it's not consistently every time. Um, 
then that can reinforce and increase the likelihood that you're going to keep trying and um, work on that skill and use that skill more often. Um, eventually, though, we want to watch for the consistent demonstration of that skill. So when our learners are consistently using that skill, using it independently without our help, then that's where we want to start fading out the reinforcement schedule. So while they're still learning how to do a task, um, we don't want to fade out how much we're reinforcing them because we want them to continue to try until they are successful at that task. But once they're successful and they can do the task um, by themselves, um, then we want to start moving that reinforcement to a more natural level. Um, what's going to maintain it in the environment? And this is where, um, if we go back to our toilet training example, when you're first getting the kid to use the toilet appropriately, you're giving a token or, a, or you're giving a, a PEZ for even a little bit of success. But over time, you're going to want to encourage and require more success in the toilet before earning that um, that Pez or that treat. And then once they got the hang of it where they're completing the skill successfully, then that's when you're going to want to start fading out how often you're giving that treat or in this case the Pez. So once we consider a skill mastered, that's generally where we're going to start fading out the reinforcement. Um, so we're going to start moving from instead of giving the candy every single time, giving the candy sometimes, and eventually giving it less and less often. Or um, when I was in grad school, what we did when we were toilet training um, in the preschool classroom is that we just cut the pieces into smaller and smaller pieces. And then the kids would stop asking because they didn't, um, you know, nobody wants an eighth of a Skittle. It's not very valuable. Um, but, uh, and there were more fun things to do, and it was already a, a habit that they were in to use the toilet. Um, for mastered skills, you do want to uh, reinforce occasionally, though. Um, Behavior is not going to maintain. They're not going to display that skill if they don't get the opportunity to uh, earn something for it. Um, I took calculus in high school and college. I couldn't do anything close to calculus now because I've never, I, I don't practice it. I don't get any reinforcement for practicing um, calculus. Um, however, for some of the other kinds of math tasks that I do in my, uh, in my daily work, like converting fractions to percents, I'm really fluent with that and I get reinforcement for that and that skill has maintained. Um, so you do want to reinforce those mastered skills, um, especially if you're seeing that someone, that your learner is starting to maybe forget, well, they used to do this, but they're not doing it anymore. First thing to look for is like, well, are they getting any reinforcement for it? Are they getting anything from it when they do display that behavior? And you might need to take a step back and, and you know, praise them more often for sitting nicely, even though we know they, can, they know how to sit nicely, but now we need to just remind them that that is something that we're looking for and acknowledge it when they're doing that and praise them for those appropriate skills. So, kind of getting into this, what should we do if the learner stops engaging in the skill? Um, we do want to go back. We want to look and, and make sure that we've conducted a, a recent preference assessment. Um, is the learner motivated by what we're offering? Um, is, is, are we even offering any reinforcement? <laughs> but is the learner motivated for what it is that we're offering? Preferences change over time, and that's fine. What they used to work for may not be valuable anymore. And for some kids, it may vary by, you know, the five minute block. They may want something new very often. Um, whereas other kids may stick with the same thing for quite a long time. So, you know, revisit your preference assessment. Um, we also want to think back to the, the DISC, those um, 
uh, characteristics we need to keep in mind for our reinforcement. D for deprivation. Is this something that um, they don't have easy access to and therefore it can be more valuable? Immediacy. Um, are we delivering it immediately? So that kind of ties into those schedules of reinforcement. Have we faded out too quickly? Um, but are they getting the reinforcer immediately? Even if you're using a token board, the token should be delivered right away upon the um, appropriate behavior. Um, or if you're just using praise, praise should be delivered right away upon the appropriate behavior, um, not hours later, it's less likely to be effective. Um, S is the size. Is the amount that we're giving that they're earning um, appropriate for the amount of work that they're engaging in? Um, again, if I'm going to have to work all week for 20 tokens to trade in for one bag of Skittles, I don't know, that might not be valuable enough for me. Um, but if I was gonna work all week for 20 tokens for um, a big fat slice of uh, red velvet cake, that might be good enough for me. So it depends upon your learner on the size. And then C, contingent. Is this a bit, available only upon the appropriate behavior and we're not handing it out for other reasons. Um, we also want to go back and look at the function of the behavior. If we are, um, especially if we're talking about uh, replacement behaviors for inappropriate behaviors, did we correctly identify the function? Has the function of the behavior changed? Um, again, kind of ties into that preference assessment. What do they want? Do they want out of math class more than they want attention? Then we need to be aware of that and we need to um, change our reinforcers to match what the function of that behavior is. And then like we just talked about the schedules of reinforcement. Um, we want to make sure that we're delivering reinforcement frequently enough to keep the learner motivated, but not so rarely that they lose interest. And it's, it's very possible if you make a big jump from um, tokens or how frequently you're delivering um, reinforcement, if you make a big jump, a big change, that it may be too big of a change for that learner. You may need to go back to where they were successful and then gradually, um, increase uh, the duration or increase the number of tokens um, that you have. So that is where we are. So we are done a little bit earlier. Before you leave, we have two things. If you'd like any questions, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so we can do that. And then I'm also going to put a um, link in the chat box for you to fill out a quick little survey on how you thought that this um, uh, webinar went and give us some feedback so that we can continue to improve those.